Ready? Okay. Okay, so this crowd does not respond to that. But many years ago, about this time of year, uh, they used to have cheerleader camp on campus. And I would be sitting in my office and have these roving squads of uh, preteens practicing in random areas, usually right outside my, my window, going, ready? Okay. Hey, 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 hey. And, 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 and um, anyway, from that, I've been known to begin lectures that way. And uh, for biology lectures, it doesn't make that much difference. But I used to teach earth science for the uh, primary education majors and found out that if you give the cheerleader, ready? Okay. About half of them will just spontaneously snap to attention. But I assume they were cheerleaders in high school and it just kind of got burned into their nervous systems. <laughs> okay, I want to flap my gums at you guys for a little bit. Um, after the break, uh, question or just, okay, you were just moving your pen and, uh, okay. Um, after the break, I want to uh, uh, show you guys a video and at the end of it, actually try to get a little bit of discussion of it going. Uh, that means no sleeping through it and then uh, waking up and expecting that I'm going to tell you what you just saw. Um, I actually do want you to internalize this because it will, it, it doesn't repeat what we're talking about in lecture, but it complements it really nicely. I mean, even though it is 40 years old, it's still uh, more timely than you might think. Okay, so we started with, uh, oh, Carol, there's a syllabus on uh, Blackboard, and uh, I did not get to it last night, but there will be handouts of yesterday's lecture that will be posted. I will try to take care of that this afternoon. I stream around the finger. <laughs> Um, and uh, that will be where handouts and things like that end up going. Okay, so we last left in uh, December 27th, 1831, when this ship called the Beagle, uh, captained by Captain Robert Fitzroy, uh, sets off from London and reaches South America in 1832 and spends the next three years traveling up and down the Atlantic coast of South America. Ever been there? Uh, okay, you might, you've heard of it. You've heard of it. <laughs> I've heard of it, Good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Again, I apologize. There's no way to dim the lights more than total darkness. So hope not too many people end up going to sleep. Okay, there we go. Now, remember, Darwin was on the voyage as the ship's naturalist. It was his job to explore the biological and geological resources of South America. Uh, the, the Beagle, Carol, since you weren't here, uh, the Beagle's job was surveying uh, the South American coastline uh, because if you're Great Britain, and you have this enormous navy, and Britannia rules the waves and all that, uh, you need accurate charts or your navy is going to run aground on the rocks that you didn't realize were there. Uh, there's also, I don't know South American history as well as I should, but this is also the time frame in which the South American countries have broken free from Spain. Uh, but that doesn't solve everything, so you've got wars popping up all over the place. What is it, Gran Colombia forms and then falls apart and, and so on. It was unsettled at the time. And the political meaning was basically for Britain to send a ship saying, okay, we're a small ship, but we've still got cannons. Don't piss us off or we'll send the big ships. You know, big powers tend to like to flex their muscle just a little bit. Um, and also maybe to scare off any of the French or anybody else who might be getting big ideas. Um, there actually was one time when they docked in Asuncion, I think it was, in Paraguay, 
at a time when they were having a, uh, a local uh, revolt was going on and uh, it was very exciting for Darwin because he had to leave the ship and go with the rest of the Beatles crew uh, with pistols drawn. Didn't actually have to shoot them, but that was that's part of the background to all of this. So they spent three years mapping the South American coast, mostly Brazil and Argentina. And Darwin turned out to be very prone to seasickness. Uh, but fortunately, since he wasn't part of the ship's crew, he was paying his own way. You know, he was outside that chain of command. Um, and because his dad was paying the bills and his dad was able to send him money even if it wasn't nearly as fast as, you know, internet banking. Uh, his dad was able to send him letters of credit and he could get money in the major cities. Uh, so he had the time and the resources to do a lot of exploring inland. Uh, so he went all the way from the coastline all the way to the Andes Mountains. Uh, he collected um, animals, birds, fossils, invertebrates, uh, rock samples, and was able to ship them back to England and uh, send letters and notes back to England. And that meant that by the time he finally got back in 1836, the scientific community knew he, who he was. He had a good reputation as a good observer. And he would go on to publish a uh, edited version of his diary um, it was originally part of the official records of the expedition, but these days it's published separately, usually under the title Voyage of the Beagle. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's a good read if you like that sort of thing, if you like narratives of sailing ships and exploration of what was still a relatively unknown place. Uh, so he got to wander in the Brazilian rainforest. You might remember that in Edinburgh, uh, he'd known the former slave, uh, John Edmonston, uh, who had told him about the rainforest of Suriname and fired his imagination. And now he got to see it for the first time. And as he said, the light itself is a weak term to express the feelings of a naturalist who for the first time has wandered by himself in a Brazilian forest. And they went down to Argentina and he got to ride with the gauchos. Um, Argentina has sizable areas of grasslands and in some ways their history parallels the American West. You have grasslands, uh, you have big cattle ranches, uh, you have cowboys who in Argentina are called gauchos. Uh, you have horrible things happening to the native peoples. That's a whole story in and of itself. And uh, Darwin got to ride with these folks. He said the gaucho is invariably most obliging, polite and hospitable, but at the same time, a bold spirited fellow. Uh, that gaucho, by the way, is not using a lasso. He's using a pair of wooden balls on a rope. We actually had some Argentinian students in here once and the word I had learned for the balls on a rope that the gaucho throws to tangle the legs of animals that he's trying to catch, I had learned they were called bolas. So I mentioned that the gaucho was using his bolas and the Argentinians started laughing because that means testicles in Argentinian Spanish. They've got a different word for those things. So the, the gaucho was not using his own testicles to uh, catch those flightless birds. And uh, incidentally, if you're wondering what ostriches are doing in Argentina, uh, those aren't ostriches, those are rheas, R-H-E-A, uh, flightless birds, related to ostriches and uh, related to emus in uh, Australia. And um, Darwin actually discovered a new species of rhea that was previously unknown to science. Uh, unfortunately, he only realized it was a new species after he and his gaucho friends had eaten most of it. Uh, but they packed up what was left, the skin and the bones, and shipped it back to England. And it was later determined to be a, uh, 
a, a previously unknown species of Rhea. Okay, just to give a little, just to give, give a little preview of something I want to talk about more later. Um, Darwin was there in part because he was incredibly easy to get along with. And I've mentioned that Fitzroy had a very short fuse. Remember, his nickname among the sailors was Hot Coffee. And after they had breakfast, the officers would come up and quietly ask Darwin if there was any hot coffee, meaning, is the captain really angry about something and is, am I going to get yelled at? Uh, so yeah, his temper was famously bad. Brazil was the only place they ever had an argument, though. Darwin was almost supernaturally gifted at being able to get along with just about anybody. His family had always been very much opposed to slavery. And as I mentioned, there wasn't any slavery in Great Britain itself at the time, but there was in the colonies, in Suriname, uh, in Jamaica. Uh, it would actually be ended in the British colonies. Now I forget the year, but it was about this time. It was, it was in the 1830s that the colonies ended it. Uh, of course, it was still going on in the United States, and it was still going on in Brazil. And Darwin and Fitzroy visited a plantation in Brazil, and they had been arguing over slavery. Darwin was very much opposed to it. Fitzroy didn't see anything wrong with it. Uh, so they asked the owner to you know, bring out some of his slaves so they could talk to them. And the slaves came out and the owner said, how do you like being slaves? And the slaves all said, oh, we love it. It's great. It's terrific. We love it. We didn't need that stupid freedom anyway. We just love it. And Fitzroy said, there, you see, it's perfectly natural. And Darwin said, look, the owner is standing right there. Did you really think they were going to tell us the truth? And Fitzroy said, are you calling me a liar? And they had a fallout for uh, a couple of days. And then they just agreed not to talk about it again. I'll actually come back to that, to Darwin's attitudes towards, towards slavery. And of course, it did eventually end in Brazil as well. Um, but that was the only thing they ever really fought about. And it almost, Darwin almost went home, but decided not to. So when he wasn't having arguments with hot coffee over slavery, or enraptured by the rainforest or the pampas, the uh, prairies of Argentina or writing with the gauchos, he went digging up South American fossils. And not this particular skeleton, uh, but this species is one of the ones he dug up. Uh, it's a beast called a glyptodon. It is roughly the size of a, a small riding lawnmower. And I'll give you two guesses as to what kind of critter it is. Um, that's your one guess. What's the other possibility? Yes. It's really large, but it was clearly quite similar to a uniquely South American group of mammals. Um, we have one species of armadillo here. It's the nine-banded armadillo, uh, otherwise known as the Texas turkey. Or back in the Great Depression, they called it the Hoover ham. But that's a relatively recent migrant. Uh, Nine-banded armadillos did not cross the Rio Grande into Texas until about 1850 or so. Um, they've been spreading north ever since. I actually, there used to be a woman working in the library who could remember being with her grandmother when her grandmother saw an armadillo and said, my God, what is that thing? Uh, we didn't have them in Arkansas until about 1920 only been here for about 100 years. Uh, so they've been spreading northward, uh, even in historic times, and their ancestors lived in South America and spread across the Isthmus of Panama, and we'll talk at the very end of the course as to how that happened. Uh, but there are, I believe, 11 species of armadillo that are native to uh, South America. Um, there are several of them, the three-banded armadillo, the six-banded armadillo, uh, the pink fairy armadillo. 
By the way, I'm not kidding about the pink fairy armadillo. That is a, uh, that, that's a, that's a thing. That is a real animal, the pink fairy armadillo. Uh, there is also the Screaming Hairy Armadillo, which I think would be a really great name for like a country punk band, <laughs> right? The Screaming Hairy Armadillos. Um, so yeah, um, armadillos are, we have one species here, but the great majority of armadillo diversity is South American. They are quintessentially South American and if this only happened once, it might not be a big deal, but it kept on happening. South America had these fossil vertebrates that Darwin and others at the same time, he wasn't the only one, uh, kept digging up and studying. And they turned out to be hauntingly similar to living vertebrates that were also unique to South America. Uh, that's a skeleton, he's got up to maybe the size of a smart car. Uh, so these got really big, it's called Mylodon, and that skeleton turns out to be very much like the skeleton of living South American mammals known as tree sloths. So there's a tree sloth on the left, and even though Mylodon had very different habits, it was way too big to hang from trees and it shambled around on the ground, uh, there are lots of features of the skeleton that the two have in common. And Darwin noted that there was this wonderful relationship in the same continent between the dead and the living. There was this way in which the fossil mammals of South America echoed the living ones. And as he said, this will, I do not doubt, throw more light on the appearance of organic beings on our earth and their disappearance from it than any other class of facts. So that's interesting. Why is there this strange similarity between the bones that Darwin is digging up uh, in Brazil and Argentina and the living critters that Darwin is studying and in some cases eating uh, in Brazil and Argentina? Why, what's, what's the connection there? What's more, some of the fossils he was finding didn't look like anything that's now living, but they seem to combine features of what we now call separate animal classes. Uh, this is one, I think this might be the actual skull that he unearthed at uh, Rio, de, Rio, Plata, Rio de la Plata in what's now Argentina, uh, Toxodon platensis. It's a mammal, uh, it's got big teeth, uh, so it's a grazer. Uh, it was pretty big. I think we're talking maybe getting up into small horse size. And when Darwin sent it back to uh, probably the top experts in vertebrate anatomy at the time in Great Britain, a guy named Richard Owen, uh, he got a report back. And as Darwin said, the structure of its teeth, as Mr. Owen states, proves indisputably that it was related intimately to the gnawers, that's rodents. In many details, it is allied to the pachydermata. So in other ways, it looks like elephants. Uh, judging from the position of its eyes, ears, and nostrils, it was probably aquatic like the dugong and manatee. How wonderfully are the different orders at the present time so well separated, blended together in different points of the structure of the toxodon. Now, people had already noticed, um, we may not have much time to go into this because I usually cover it in a different class I teach called History of Life. Uh, but people had already worked out a way that you can tell time using fossils. And even though we don't, even though nobody had absolute dates yet, you could still tell which fossils were older and which were younger. And it was already known that the older the rocks that you looked in, the less familiar uh, the fossils were and the fewer uh, living species you could find. Uh, so if you look at fossils that are only like 10, 20,000 years, a lot of them are going to look very familiar. 
if you look at fossils from 300 million years ago, um, life just looks very, very different. And Darwin's pointing out that not only as you go back in time, not only do you get unfamiliar critters, but you get unfamiliar critters that blur the boundaries between what we now call very separate taxa, very separate classes and orders. Huh. Wonder why. Let's uh, think about that for a bit. And go to the next presentation. There. So as Darwin's thinking about all this, uh, the Beagle sails down the coast and uh, begins exploring the rather treacherous waters at the southern tip of South America. Uh, going around uh, southern Argentina and navigating its way around the um... okay now I'm, okay what's that yeah navigating through the Straits of Magellan I was momentarily puzzled as to whether it's the Cape Horn or the Cape of Good Hope that they're going around uh, but he goes through the Straits of Magellan. Uh, they actually navigated a uh, undiscovered uh, passage through the Straits of Magellan uh, that's still called the Beagle Channel. And there is actually a Mount Darwin at the southern tip of, of South America, uh, which got named because one day they were out in a small boat and um, it's, uh, what was it? Okay, I think they were on shore and a freak wave almost carried their boat away and Darwin was the guy who ran and grabbed it and ended up saving them. Uh, so yeah, there's actually a mountain named after him way down at the south tip of South America. And the Beagle encountered the southernmost of all Native American people. Uh, in the Beagle account, they're called the Fuegians because they live on the island of Tierra del Fuego. Uh, they themselves called themselves uh, Yamana or uh, Yagan. They had some other names. There's a couple of, of different tribal groups down there. They're the southernmost of all Native Americans and have some of the, how do I want to put this? Simplest and sparsest material culture. They're not city builders. They're not farmers. I mean, this is practically Antarctica here. You can't farm. Uh, they're primarily hunt and gather seafood, uh, building uh, small yet sturdy boats and spending a lot of time out on the water, uh, dressing mostly in skin, skins, uh, domestic dogs to help them. Uh, but not with a very advanced material culture. They don't make lots and lots of things. Now I've got to give you some, a little bit of backstory here. And again, this, this is actually not biographical trivia. I'm going to make a point with all of this. Remember that this is the Beagle's second voyage. And the first voyage had been commanded by a chap named Captain Pringle Stokes, and he had been the guy who shot himself. And Fitzroy was brought in to take over and, and finish. And then as soon as they got back to Britain in 1830, he started lobbying to go back a second time and really do the job right. Now, on that first voyage, they had encountered the Fuegians, and people who are hunter and hunter-gatherers, anything, any personal property more than you can carry with you doesn't really make a lot of sense. You know, they don't have permanent houses or settlements. Uh, they don't have a lot of space to put lots of stuff. And in societies like that, they've often got a fairly relaxed attitude towards personal property. Um, and a couple of Fuegians stuck on board the Beagle one night and stole one of the ship's smaller boats. Now, Fitzroy wanted to punish them, uh, so he uh, 
captured a Fuegian man and held him hostage on the ship and waited for his boat to be returned and the boat never got returned. So dang it, he's out on the boat and he's got this Fuegian dude on board his ship. What's he going to do? He gets the great idea to take some Fuegians back to Britain and give them an education, teach them how to speak English and worship the correct God in the correct way and wear Western clothing and settle down in you know, nice houses and farms instead of wearing skins and eating raw shellfish and get them all properly civilized. And then once he's done that, he can take them back to South America and they will civilize the entire tribe. It ended up not working very well, but that's one of the reasons why Fitzroy really wanted to go back a second time um, was he had these Fuegians on his ship and he had to return them. Uh, the Fuegian that he'd originally captured uh, unfortunately died in, in Britain of disease. Uh, we don't know his name. Uh, the sailors called him Boat Memory. And we don't know what his native name uh, might have been. We don't know much about oral boat memory. Uh, but Fitzroy had also gotten a uh, girl of about 10 or 11 and a teenage boy and a um, mature man uh, estimated to be in his 30s, more or less. And that's what the Fuegians look like in their native state. Uh, he, had the, uh, he had these four Fuegians uh, educated in England. Uh, both memory died pretty soon. Um, the girl, the sailors nicknamed her Fuegia Basket. And the boy they called Jimmy Button because supposedly his mother had traded him for a pearl button. And the older man uh, in his 30s was very tall and the sailors named him after a church with a famous tall tower in England, and they called him York Minster. Uh, so that's Jimmy Button, by the way, uh, real name Orundeli Co. Um, before and after uh, he got cleaned up, and you can say that Jimmy Button cleaned up pretty well. And the reason I'm dragging this out is that Darwin got an experience on the Beagle that is much, much more difficult to get these days. And that is he got to talk to the Fuegians. They learned enough English to communicate and they were never fluent, but uh, you know, he was able to, to talk with them. And he was able to communicate with them and one of the great lessons that he took from it is that although the Fuegians and the English had lifestyles as different as you can imagine, their minds were essentially the same. They could understand each other perfectly well, you know, not just on factual matters, but on things like humor. Uh, Jimmy Button, the expression of his face showed his nice disposition. He was merry and often laughed and was remarkably sympathetic with anyone in pain. I mentioned Darwin used to get really seasick. So whenever he was throwing up over the side of the beagle, Jimmy Button would come over and pat him on the back and say, poor, poor fellow. And then Jimmy Button would laugh because Jimmy Button had spent, you know, his entire life in tiny little boats on stormy Antarctic oceans. And, you know, if, if you're prone to seasickness in an environment like that, you just die. You know, it, 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 see, he didn't understand what seasickness was. So he probably felt pity at this, you know, poor weirdo who keeps throwing up on perfect, on what to him were perfectly calm days at sea. And Darwin remembered that, that he was able not just to talk with them, but to joke with them, to understand their humor, and as he would write years later, uh, by the way, that's Fuegia Basket at the top left, Jimmy Button in the middle, and uh, York Minster down at the bottom. And as he wrote, the Fuegians ranked among the lowest barbarians, but I was 
continually struck with surprise how closely the three natives on board HMS Beagle, who had lived some years in England and could talk a little English, resembled us in disposition and in most of our mental faculties. Uncomfortable thought. These were, by the standards of the time, degraded savages, you know, living without, you know, building houses or making machinery or anything like that, living only on the food they could hunt or gather. And yet, they're fundamentally like us deep down. Under the skin, under the culture, human minds are fundamentally the same. For the time, that was pretty woke. Um, I'll talk a little bit later about uh, that issue. Oh, by the way, just to end the story, uh, the beagle was not just carrying the three surviving Fuegians, it was also carrying a, a young missionary, a guy named Robert Matthews, uh, who was being sponsored by some church in England uh, to go convert the Fuegians. And uh, these sweet little old church ladies in England uh, were sending not just this missionary, but all the things he was going to need uh, to run a mission station in uh, Antarctic South America. So they sent him with like, like a full set of wine glasses and things like that, because that is, of course, exactly what you're going to need if you're living in Tierra del Fuego. And anyway, they put Robert Matthews aside at a place where he was going to build a house and a church and run this mission station and make all of the Fuegians into proper Christians. Uh, the Fuegians probably stole everything he had, and then they tried to kill him. So the beetle had to pick him up a few days later, and uh, the attempt to Christianize the Fuegians ended in a complete failure. Um, unfortunately, most of the Fuegians would end up wiped out uh, as Argentinian settlement expanded southward. Uh, the last native speaker of the Yamana language died a few years ago, unfortunately. Um, I don't know if there are any full-blooded Yamana people left. I mean, there's still people with that ancestry, uh, but unfortunately, there's not much of a tribe. Oh, and incidentally, part of the reason why Fitzroy was so eager to get the Fuegians back to South America uh, was that York Minster was having sex with Fuegia Basket. Um, and he was terribly afraid a scandal was going to break out because she's 10 and he's 30. Uh, so they, that's partly why he was in such a rush to get them home. And as soon as uh, he got them home, York Minster ran off with Fuegia Basket and was never seen again. Okay, so there. Sorry, that ended on a positive note. Okay, they sailed up the Pacific coast of Chile and reached uh, the town of Concepcion. And Concepcion had just been hit with an earthquake, uh, a really big one, estimated 8.2 magnitude. Uh, the city's pretty much trashed. And remember, Darwin had been reading Lyle, and we talked about how, among other things, Lyle had um, explored the ruins of the temple of Serapis on Sicily and worked out from indirect lines of evidence that it had been built on land and then the land must have subsided and then the land must have risen again, right? We went over that? Yes. Uh, not because of some sort of unprecedented catastrophe, but by the actions of ordinary earthquakes uh, over the course of, uh, of 2,000 years. And if a few earthquakes over 2,000 years can cause land levels to change that much, what might they do over millions of years? Uh, well, Darwin found, walking around on the beaches outside of Concepcion, he found these big banks of clams, of oysters and mussels uh, that had been living underwater because clams don't do very well on land, right? So they've been living where they've been submerged and now they've been lifted out of the sea and probably smelled really bad at this stage uh, by as much as 10 feet. 
So he could see that the effects of the quake had been to raise the land uh, by as much as 10 feet. And then hiking in the, um, uh, in the Andes, uh, leaving the Beagle and going uphill up into the Andes Mountains, uh, he found fossil beds of seashells uh, looking like this. this. I don't know if Darwin visited this one, but that land surface that the guy is walking on is basically a solid mass of seashells. And there are these shell beds as high as 1,300 feet. How did they get there? You don't need some massive global flood or anything like that. You need earthquakes, which can be pretty catastrophic, but they're not out of the ordinary. You know, earthquakes still happen on that coast. Each one may be raising the coast just a couple of feet, maybe 10 feet, and certainly not much more. But stretched out over long periods of time, they can lift what used to be coastline a thousand feet, uh, maybe more. And this is why Lyle really wanted to meet this guy when he got back, uh, because it's a beautiful application of Lyle's ideas Darwin was able to show. Um, one of the first books that Darwin published, by the way, was a book on the geology of South America, where he was able to, uh, uh, that's where he wrote this up and uh, wrote up uh, well, the rest of his findings. Okay. Oh yeah, he crossed the Andes from the Pacific side and uh, actually discovered a petrified forest, a uh, rock body with a bunch of buried trees uh, where the trees have fossilized and turned into stone. Uh, there's, the, uh, there's a plaque erected in honor of his visit in 2009 at Agua de la Sora in uh, Chile. And here's another case. That's, that's one of the actual petrified tree trunks. And the wood was so well preserved that you could slice it and look at the, uh, the fine structure of the wood. And it turned out to re resemble a South American conifer called Araucaria. Uh, what are the Araucarias you know? The, uh, we used to have these in the botanical garden at my graduate school. There's one called the monkey puzzle tree uh, because it's so spiky, it's a real puzzle for a monkey to figure out how to climb it. Uh, do you get these in, in Brazil, or is this more is, is this more on the on the west coast? No, we had a really nice thing in Rio. It's pretty cool to see. Okay. Right. Yeah, there's this whole family of conifers um, that are found only in South America and also in Australia. Uh, one of the Australian species is called the Norfolk Island pine, and I mentioned this because you can sometimes buy them like at, at Kroger round about Christmas time uh, because they, they make nice little potted Christmas trees if you want one of those. So anyway, here's that link again between fossils and living species. You know, why are we finding fossil Araucaria on the same continent where we're finding living Araucarias? And how are we doing, how did great big trees used to how did they grow in what is now desert 7,000 feet above sea level? 2,000 meters above sea level. Well, maybe we could use Lyle for this. Maybe the place where these Araucarias grew didn't always used to be desert and wasn't always 7,000 feet up in the mountains. Maybe it used to be a lot lower and a lot moister and this process of gradual elevation of the seacoast, one earthquake at a time, uh, is why we now find these fossil Araucarias at a, a height and in a climate where Araucarias today can't grow. Hmm. Seems to make sense. And as he wrote, it is hardly possible to doubt that this great elevation has been affected by successive small uprisings, such as that which accompanied or caused the earthquake of this year, and likewise by an insensibly slow rise, which is certainly in progress in some parts of this coast. So very Lyellian there. 
So they've been sailing for four years. Everybody is thoroughly sick and tired of smelling each other's feet, and they're ready to go home. Um, unfortunately, they're on the opposite side of South America, and the Panama Canal would not exist for another 80 or so years, 70, 75. The Panama Canal's not there. So the Beagle uh, sails across the Pacific, leaves, I guess what's now Peru, sails across the Pacific all the way to Australia, bounces around Australia, crosses the Indian Ocean, uh, rounds the Cape of Good Hope in South Africa, crosses the Atlantic and hits Brazil one last time just to check their instruments and then gets back to England in October of 1836. And on the way back, they spent five weeks stopping for food and water on some tiny islands in the middle of the Pacific that had been named for the Spanish word for tortoises, uh, the Galapagos Islands. This is far and away the most famous part of the Beagle voyage. And ironically, it wasn't the main focus of it. The main mission of the Beagle was to map mainland South America. Uh, Galapagos was just a, uh, a fairly brief stop. It wasn't the main thing they were sent out to do. Uh, the Galapagos are about 600 miles off the coast of Ecuador, and they are right on the equator, uh, but they are not tropical islands uh, with, um, you know, palm trees and tropical, you know, soft tropical storms and uh, waiters coming to your beach chair to bring you uh, uh, fancy frozen rum drinks with paper umbrellas in them. Uh, the Galapagos are actually kept fairly cool uh, because you've got this cold water current uh, coming up the west side of South America and uh, hitting the Galapagos right there. Uh, so they're actually fairly cool. Uh, they're quite dry. Thanks to this phenomenon that I'm not going to have much time to talk about called ENSO, uh, the El Nino Southern Oscillation. Um, you know, that's that every few years we have that shift in the climate caused by weakening of circulation in the South Pacific. And in El Nino years, the Galapagos get absolutely hammered by drought. Uh, so they get very severe drought. Um, much of the fresh water that's available comes from clouds because the Galapagos are volcanic mountains. And you'll get clouds on the tops of the mountains and then condensation will run down into the craters of uh, these, these volcanoes. And that's what much of the life on the Galapagos uh, has to survive on. Uh, they're volcanic and eruptions still do happen occasionally. Uh, that's Isla Fernandina erupting in April 2009. And I need to update this slide because uh, there was another major one in the past couple of years. Um, they, they still have them going on. Now I can't remember if it was 2018 or 2019 or might be more recent than that. And they have minor eruptions on a fairly regular basis. Uh, but eruptions are still going on. And that's actually some congealed lava. Uh, lava can congeal into rock that has this very ropey uh, surface, kind of like if you pour hot fudge into a cold pan, you get the same kind of ripple effect. And it was fairly easy to show with just plain old Lyellian reason that the Galapagos Islands were relatively young. They're still being built. Uh, they're not very big. All of the fossils that have been found in the Galapagos Islands are very close to living species. You don't get those weird toxodon type things that blur the boundaries between what are now separate uh, classes and orders. Um, and you conclude that the Galapagos Islands are a lot younger than the South American mainland. And there's wildlife on the Galapagos, a lot of it beautifully adapted to um, uh, a rather harsh environment. And 
with a lot of very unique forms. Uh, Sula Nabuksiai there, this is the blue-footed booby. Uh, I should mention that booby was a slang term at the time for idiot. And the sailors called it that because blue-footed boobies didn't have any fear of people. So they would walk right up to you instead of running like hell the way any animal with a lick of sense knows to do when confronted with a human being who's probably going to kill it for fun. Um, and yeah, this is, a, this is a male, this is the courtship dance. He is showing off those, uh, those awesome feet uh, with their beautiful shade of, of blue. This is ba basically twerking. And blue-footed boobies and their relatives. There's another species, the, the masked booby, and another one whose name I forget. They're not unique to the Galapagos because these are seabirds. They can fly over water for long distances. And so you find these on the Pacific coast of mainland South and Central America. They're not unique to the Galapagos. But it turns out that a surprising number of species are unique to the Galapagos. Uh, so Leucophaeus fuliginosus is the Galapagos gull. It looks pretty much like other seagulls that you could find in the New World. But that particular species is not the same as gulls you find anywhere else in the world. It's a gull, but it's a variety of gull that is unique to the Galapagos, only found there. Uh, the Galapagos hawk, it's in the same genus as birds that we actually get around here. It's in genus Buteo, uh, which includes the red-tailed hawk and the red-shouldered hawk, uh, which I can actually see on my property some days, which you've, you know, some of you have probably seen. Um, I've seen red-tailed hawks nesting in some of the trees um, like in that subdivision just across Ferris from uh, campus. Uh, we'll get them around here. And the Galapagos hawk is in the same genus, but it's still not like hawks found anywhere else in the world. It's unique to the Galapagos Islands. Uh, so is the Galapagos penguin. Uh, now, Everybody knows about the penguins that live in Antarctica, but there are penguins that live in South Africa. Uh, there are penguins that live on the south coast of Australia. The Australian blue penguin is absolutely adorable. And there are penguins that live on uh, the southern tip of South America. Uh, there are penguins that Darwin would have already seen in, uh, like, up the coast of Chile. The Galapagos penguin is the northernmost one, and it actually makes it just a tiny bit into the northern hemisphere because the Galapagos Islands straddle the equator. And it is similar to penguins you find everywhere else, but it's not identical. It is its own species. Bird, excuse me. It is its own species. Uh, iguanas, typical of Central and South America. The Galapagos have two species of iguana, but they don't make a living like other iguanas. These iguanas will sit on rocks in the sun and bask until they fully warm up and then jump into the ocean and swim around and eat seaweed and then crawl back out on land to warm up again. That's kind of a weird lifestyle for a lizard. Uh, they're very territorial, by the way. Darwin actually was uh, hiking in the Galapagos and he found a colony of these iguanas that were all sitting there in the sun. And he picked one up and he threw it into the ocean. And it came swimming back and got back out on land and came right back to uh, where it had been sitting when he threw it. So he picked it up and threw it again. And it came right back to its spot. And apparently he spent a good chunk of the afternoon throwing this iguana into the ocean. And the iguana always came back to exactly the same spot. They're very territorial uh, that way. And they are also unique to the Galapagos. You can find iguanas all over South America, but you don't find these guys anywhere but the Galapagos. And this happened time and time again. There are like three species of mockingbird that are unique to the Galapagos. 
there's a species of wild tomato, uh, a relative of cultivated uh, tomatoes, genus like a persicon, that is found only in the Galapagos. Uh, prickly pear cactus are found in North and South America. Uh, we even get them in the Ozarks. There are species that are native uh, here. Uh, but in the Galapagos, there are six species of prickly pear cactus, including some that form trees. So this is weird. You have all of this life that is hauntingly familiar and looks like life forms you could find on the mainland of South America or maybe Central America. And yet, and yet, and yet, and yet, and yet, and yet it's not the same. Two more. Uh, Geochiloni elephantibus is the Galapagos tortoise. Uh, they're in the same genus as uh, gopher tortoises that live in places like the Western US desert, uh, but they're quite a bit larger. Uh, they're big enough that you can sit on one and try to ride it, uh, which Darwin did. He reported sitting on one of these tortoises, and he didn't really go very far because the tortoise just kind of stood there and kept looking, kept, you know, twisting its neck to stare at him and go, oh. So, uh, yeah, don't, um, yeah, tortoise rides really don't take you very far. Uh, but that's how big they are. Uh, unfortunately, they're quite endangered in this day and age. And part of the reason is that the reason anybody would stop in the Galapagos is you could capture a bunch of tortoises and the beagle caught about a hundred, I think. And being desert animals, they could live for weeks without water. So you could bring them aboard the ship, turn them upside down uh, so that they couldn't move and they would survive that way for weeks and you could eat them. Uh, so the beagle had a lot of turtle soup uh, on the mess for the next few weeks. It was a way of getting fresh meat. And this is part of the reason why uh, a lot of those tortoises these days are in danger. Um, of course, the rats eating their eggs didn't help either. Uh, but anyhow, Darwin was having dinner one night with the governor of the Galapagos Islands, the, the guy who was in charge of a couple of hundred, you know, castaways and riffraff uh, living in the islands at the time. And the governor happened to mention that, you know, whenever we have turtle, which we do an awful lot because we're stuck here in the bleeping Galapagos, I can tell what island the turtle has come from by differences in the shell shape. And Darwin confirmed that. He found that each island, and in the case of the, uh, the largest island, Isabella, Isabella is made up of five major mountain peaks. And you have populations of tortoises living on top of each mountain peak. Remember I said there's not a lot of moisture in the Galapagos Islands and what there is condenses out of the clouds, right? So those craters on the tops of the volcanic mountains are places where water tends to naturally collect. That's where you'll find the richest vegetation and that's where you'll find uh, the tortoise populations. And Darwin found that each mountain peak on Isabella and every separate island had different varieties of tortoise. There were 14, I think, we eventually worked out, there were 14 different Galapagos tortoise varieties uh, distinguished by shape of the shell. Uh, you can see that the becai, the one up there at the top, has an extension of the shell that would cover its neck. Uh, the others don't. Uh, Vicina is kind of square and Guthera is kind of round and some of them have fine grooves and some of them don't. Uh, it's pretty subtle, but you can still consistently tell these different populations apart by small differences in shell shape. Now that's weird. Why? Why do we have 14 subtly different varieties of Galapagos tortoise in these tiny little nearly desert islands and nowhere else in the world. What are they doing there? How did they get there? 
Last Galapagos beasts I'll talk about, Galapagos finches. Uh, finches are seed-eating birds in the family Fringillidae. Uh, the finch that you would know best would be cardinals. They are finches. Uh, if you've hung out with Vicki McDonald, uh, you might have seen, uh, what do we get, purple finches and things like that. We, we have finches here. And there are 14 species of finch in the Galapagos Islands, well, 13 in the Galapagos and one in a tiny island to the north called Cocos Island. And that's one of them, that's the small brown finch, uh, Geospitza fuliginosa. The 14 species of finch are found on different islands, although they overlap. Uh, the tortoises don't really overlap because tortoises don't have an easy time migrating from one mountain peak across desert to the next mountain peak. Uh, the finches, of course, can fly, so they do overlap a bit, but they don't all live in exactly the same ranges. Each species of finch also has a very distinctive way of life and is adapted to it. The um, small ground finch uh, feeds on seeds and feeds on small seeds, so it's got a small beak. On the right, the large ground finch feeds on larger seeds. That, big, that much bigger beak is less well adapted to handle small seeds, but that beak and the muscles attached to it can exert more force, uh, so it can crack larger seeds than the small beak ground finch can. Uh, and then the cactus finch on the left, you can see it's got a um, longer and narrower beak. Uh, that's because it spends a lot of time on prickly pear cactus. And if you're going to be eating flowers, fruit, and bugs on a cactus, you want a nice long beak that is not, you know, will be some protection from spines in your face. Yes. And you can, you can compare these. You know, the cactus finch's beak is more like a pair of tweezers. And uh, the large ground finch's beak is more like a pair of linesman's pliers or some other type of pliers you could get at the hardware store that's heavier and can't pick up delicate things, but that you can exert more force with. They're all finches. Darwin didn't actually realize this until he got his specimens back to England and got them looked at by the top bird expert at the time, um, a man named John Gould. And it was Gould that told him, hey, all of these birds that look so different, they're all finches. They all share this common structure. And yet they have all these diverse adaptations to different lifestyles. And again, they're all unique to the Galapagos. Uh, they are similar to Birds in the genus Tyaris, I don't know if you get them in Brazil, but you would get them on the Pacific coast. The English name is Grasquits. Okay. All right. Well, they are similar to South American birds, but the species themselves are unique. And there's 14 of them. And they're all adapted to different lifestyles. On these islands that haven't been around for a long time, how did they get there? What are they doing there? Why do we have finches with great big parrot-like beaks, but we don't have any like actual parrots? Huh. As he wrote, seeing this gradation and diversity of structure in one small, intimately related group of birds, one might really fancy that from an original paucity of birds in this archipelago, a small number of birds in this group of islands is what that means. One species had been taken and modified for different ends. Oh, by the way, the woodpecker finch probes in rotten bark for insects, and uh, it's a tool user. It will take a little twig or a spine and use it as a tool to probe in uh, rotten wood. Uh, the vampire finch right there actually reminds me of this bean we used to have. Uh, it can feed on insects and things like that, but what it loves to do is sneak up behind nesting seabirds like blue-footed boobies or albatross and or seagulls and peck them in the butt with a really sharp beak 
and lap up the drops of blood. It is a blood sucking bird. And yes, I have had supervisors before who like nothing better than to sneak up behind you and stab you right in the butt and, uh, and feed off your blood. Uh, we had a dean in this college who, uh, that was basically how, how he, he operated. He was, he was a perfect example of GSP to the facilities. So yeah, what are you doing? With, what are we doing with all these crazy finches in one little place? Okay, almost done, and then we'll take a break. Uh, the Beagle then left the Galapagos. They crossed the Pacific to Australia. Big thing Darwin noticed here is that Australian mammals look like whoever created them was copying other people's notes. Uh, what's the critter on the left look like? Looks like a flying squirrel. Uh, what's the critter on the right look like? What's that? Uh, like muskrat or something? Maybe a muskrat, chipmunk. chipmunk. Uh, it's actually a nighttime predator. Uh, the local name for it is native cat. So I guess it, it's got a little bit too long of a schnoz to be a cat, but it is a uh, a uh, predator on you know small birds and things like that, and it does hunt by night. But in fact, that's not a flying squirrel at all. That's a marsupial. Uh, it's more closely related to possums than anything else. Uh, it gives birth to these underdeveloped young and then raises them in a pouch, similar to kangaroos. And again, possums are the marsupials that you know that are native to North America. You've got a lot more species in South America, but um, uh, only one species has migrated into North America. We'll talk about that migration later. Uh, and it's not closely related to flying squirrels at all or to any rodent. And the native cat, AKA the quoll, has a lifestyle similar to cats or maybe similar to weasels and things like that, but it isn't, it's another marsupial. Uh, with the exception of a very small number of uh, mouse species, bats, whales, seals, and some human introduced animals like dingoes, Australian mammals are almost all marsupials. And they have this very strange way of looking like European or North American mammals. So there is a marsupial mole in Australia that is nearly blind and digs through soil and is not at all closely related to European or North American moles. Uh, you have the sugar glider, which looks hauntingly like a flying squirrel, but is not. Uh, you've got a numbat down there, which is toothless and has a long sticky tongue and big claws to rip open anthills and termite mounds and lives the same way as an anteater, but isn't, it's a marsupial. And this is very odd, the way that Australian mammals seem to mimic mammals in the rest of the world. And as Darwin thought and, and noted in his diary, a disbeliever in everything beyond his own reason might exclaim, surely two distinct creators must have been at work. Their object, however, has been the same. It's like one god must have made the rest of the world and another god must have made Australia. And the God of Australia must have been copying the notes of the God of, of everything else. So why is that? Why would you get marsupials that are not at all related to placental mammals from other continents and yet look hauntingly like them? Hmm. We'll leave that for now. Uh, the beagle crossed the Indian Ocean. They stopped on some coral islands uh, like this. This is an atoll. Uh, an island made of coral rubble that's shaped like a ring with a shallow lagoon in the center and then very steep drop-offs to the very deep ocean um, on the outside. We don't really have time to go into this, but Lyle came up with a very Lyellian theory for how they formed. Uh, what happens that as extinct volcanoes slowly sink down under their own weight, their sinking down is balanced by coral reefs growing upwards. 
and you end up going from a volcanic island like the Galapagos to a lower volcanic island that's surrounded with a coral reef to a lower volcanic island that's got a reef and a lagoon to an island that is just a lagoon. And his model was actually demonstrated to be right, but not until the 1950s uh, when US scientists started drilling into coral islands and taking very deep samples of the rocks that they were made of, uh, because that's where we were testing nuclear weapons. Um, yeah, we did nuclear tests on islands like Inuitak, and we actually did nuclear tests on a different island. We did these nuclear tests on an extremely small island in the Pacific uh, that nobody had ever heard of, but it was in the news for a while. And a French swimwear designer designed a swimsuit that was about as small as this tiny island in the Pacific and covered a very, very small area indeed and named it after the island and called it Bikini. Yeah, if anybody wanted to know, the name of the Bikini comes from this tiny Pacific island that was famous because the US freaking nuked it. But before we nuked it, we drilled into it and sampled the rock layers and found out that Darwin's model of atoll formation uh, was basically right. And he would publish this in 1842. That's a diagram. So they rounded Africa, they sailed up the Atlantic, they stopped in Brazil one more time because uh, I, I, I guess they just hadn't had enough fun on Ipanema or something like that or maybe hadn't, hadn't, had enough, uh, hadn't had enough of meat at the Churrascaria Brazilian Steakhouse or something. Actually, they stopped there because Fitzroy had been making very careful observations of uh, longitude. And he wanted to make, and to do that, you need extremely accurate clocks. And he wanted to make sure, uh, he wanted to measure how much his clocks had drifted over five years. Uh, so he had to repeat longitude measurements at the beginning and at the end of his voyage. And it turned out they were quite accurate. Uh, the maps the Beagle made were so accurate that the British Navy kept using them until the coming of satellite mapping. You know, these days you don't have to map from the ground when you can just photograph everything from satellites. Uh, but they were used for over 100 years. That's how good they were. And they finally got back to England on October the 2nd, 1836. Um, Darwin lived in London for a while and then bought a house that used to be in a quiet country village just outside of London, but London has grown up so much that it's now pretty much buried in the suburbs of London. Uh, it's a museum and uh, he lived there from 1842 until he died in 1883 and then until his wife died in 1896. And now you can tour it if you're ever in London. And that's a good place to stop and give you folks a break and let you get the circulation back into your uh, posteriors. Uh, so go ahead and take about 15. Um, I have... 1014, so we'll reconvene at 1030. And I don't think I want to lecture anymore, but I do want to uh, I do want to show you this quick and then maybe get some discussion in at the very end.